This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl. Extinction Rebellion is a global collective of individuals turned activists to stage nonviolent mass protests to address the horrifying crisis this planet now faces. These are some thoughts from their mission statement. History is calling from the future. A hundred years from now. Half a hundred years. Ten. Today. Calling the conscience of humanity to act with the fierce urgency of now. This is the time. Wherever we are standing is the place. We have just this one flickering instant to hold the winds of worlds in our hands to vouchsafe the future. This is what destiny feels like. Time is broken and buckled, and seasons are out of step, so even the plants are confused. Ancient wisdoms are being betrayed. Something in the human spirit, too, is threatened with extinction. Many feel exhausted, ignored, lonely, and anxious, humiliated by poverty and inequality, crushed by debt, powerless, controlled, and trapped. Many feel defrauded of what should rightfully be theirs. Societies are polarized, people estranged from each other, and sundered from the living world. The contract is broken, and it is happening on our watch. A pathological obsession with money and profit is engineering this breakdown. Warped and spiritually desolate, the system is contemptuous of humanity and the living world and held in place by a toxic media, by toxic finance and toxic politics, power without principle. The world's resources are being seized faster than the natural world can replenish them. This is an emergency. Extinction Rebellion is young, old, black, white, indigenous, of all faiths and none, of all genders and sexualities and none. Being alive on Earth now is all the qualifications required. It is a rebellion against the heartless, loveless, and lifeless delusion of seeing Earth as dead matter. It is against patriarchy's domination and control of women and the earth, against heterosexism that condemns the beauty of diverse love, against the militarism that destroys living lands, wages war for oil, and kills those who protect the green world. This rebellion uses the finest weapons, peace, truth, love. It is strictly nonviolent as an active stance. This is life in rebellion for life. This is Extinction Rebellion. This is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, even the producer Simon Slater is here, and one of my favorite gals, troublemaker extraordinaire. Oh, yeah, she's dangerous. Sheriff Creo of Extinction Rebellion. Welcome, my friend. Thank you. Happy to join in the midst of an eco side. It's good times. Well, I love you for many reasons, but especially for getting kicked out of Berlin one night, the club I often play at. Are you still banned? (laughs) You know, you throw me out. Honestly, if you make that mistake, because not much warrants me being thrown out of anywhere. If I got thrown out, it's because you fucking asked for it. So I will never frequent a place again. Fair enough. That's can, you, can you share with us in a reduction? Well, what the fuck happened? Well, I mean, I just, you know, sort of got right into the, the fuck bombs over here. But really, I have very good manners. Okay. And there's like a protocol of bar behavior. And I also live by the code of feminist behavior. So when you cross the line and you're no longer like a sister, then I'm probably going to take issue with that. And I would say that I was treated very disrespectfully as a respectful patron because I was dealing with a sister who wasn't really a sister. But, it, you know, you know, more to, to wrap that story up quick. The interesting part, truthfully, was like I can take, you know, I was pretty chill and pretty calm about it. I was like, OK, so Missy is very badly behaved. I can let that fly. But then all of a sudden, the pretend fucking muscle boys like arrived Uh. out of nowhere. And I'm one female, you know, so I'm not throwing anything. I'm being pretty calm. I let the moment pass. No big deal. And then all of a sudden, I've got a bouncer on me. Whoa. Uh, Yeah, the guy upstairs. Oh, wait a second. Let me interrupt for a minute. That's why. And ask Tim Dahl. 
who do I make friends with the minute I walk into any club? Oh, yes. The, the well, biggest the, the biggest, biggest guy. Guy there. And usually that's the bouncer, but not always. Uh, maybe you make friends with both of them, but you have your special techniques. Anyway, uh, getting kicked out of a bar is nothing. Was that the performance we were doing together, Lydia? Was it no, I, I think it was another night. Okay. No, she would have never got kicked out while we were performing. That's ridiculous. Oh, okay, 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 okay. But getting kicked out of a bar, no biggie. How many times have you been arrested now with your protest for Extinction Rebellion, my friend? Uh, last year it was, or we're in 2020. So 2019, it was a couple times. And there's, there's a point, quite honestly, where you're holding information. And so it's not a good idea to, to go on the, the inside, quote unquote. But I'm back on the, what we call like the outer ring of things. And that gives you a whole lot of freedom. Okay, so let, let's just back up a little bit. So Extinction Rebellion is a very necessary group collected around the, the globe of individuals, nonviolent protest against not only uh, the coming extinction, which is happening, climate change, which is devastating, the patriarchy, just injustice in general, but injustice against the female planet we live on. Exactly. Yeah. So we have four core demands. The first one is tell the truth. And it really is like we've got to start telling these hard, blunt truths. But the other demand that isn't quite as understood, I think, by everyone is what's called citizens' assemblies as part of power to the people and us being part of a decision-making process, anything that government is doing. And so the idea of people's assemblies and citizens' assemblies, we've really been pushing that out there for a while. What is your title in the Extinction Rebellion organization, because I know you are dedicated, nonstop working to get the word out, to organize things. I mean, is there a title? How does that even come together? How did you get involved uh, with this incredible and necessary protest collection? So one of the things that resonated with me about the work that Extinction Rebellion does, and this will answer the question, do I have some type of a title? Yes. Am I going to say it on this show? No, because the fact is that we're all quote unquote crew. And that's how the movement functions because it's a decentralized movement, which is very opposite of any kind of type top down hierarchical structure. And it needs to stay that way in order for it to expand and mobilize very quickly. So you know, we all play a role and there may be some name attached to that, but in no construct whatsoever is, is it an organization with typical understood leadership. And people come into it and contribute whatever they can do best to get the word out or to organize. So everybody is playing a very mandatory part. What's interesting to me now is how long has Extinction Rebellion actually been very active? I mean, in the last two years, they've been very active both in London, New York, and, and various other places around the world. The birth of it in the U.S. was at the tail end of 2018, beginning of 2019. Globally, it kicked off in the U.K., a, l a little bit before that. And, you know, we saw them shutting down bridges, et cetera. And so it really kind of landed in the U.S., in New York, pretty shortly thereafter. And that's when it got here. It's been hard to actually move it as quickly as we see in other parts of the world in the U.S. And I think that's because of all the shit that you bring up and, you know, we know about our politics and government. Do, do you so think forth. it's going to be any easier? Because, I mean, a lot of the protests that are going on right now, okay, for instance, we're over a hundred days into the COVID quarantine, opening up in some places, spreading rapidly in others. It is not under control. It is an abomination. Part of one could say Mother Nature's revenge because we've been fucking Mother Nature for too far fucking long and things like that are going to happen. And the protests that are happening now that are too long in the coming. We have the Black Lives Matter. We have people that are just... They can't take it anymore. Probably the reason the Black Lives Matter protest is so successful is because not only can nobody take it, nobody's got a fucking job right now. <laughs> right, exactly. And so cause yeah. can somehow does Extinction Rebellion, like I know you're, you're going to City Hall tomorrow. This will probably air after that. But uh, can somehow, because 
all of it is about injustice, prejudice, disconcern, and basically murder. All of it is about injustice, 1,000%. The challenge right now is, and this is directly from Black Lives Matter. I marched with Black Lives Matter in 2016, and obviously on the activist front, you're trying to find allies and make sure that you're working together always round. So, you know, I've been on a few of their calls lately. This term is from them, find your lane. So you can support what's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement. And when you drill into it, there's a lane for everyone. So ours is climate justice is racial justice. And that's what has to be found so that the divisiveness, the powers that be do not succeed at dividing us. And it doesn't boil down to just a kind of black, white. I want to talk about that for a minute, because when you say that the disregard and murder of the planet has so much to also do with racial injustice for these reasons. First of all, where do most of the poor people, impoverished black people live around toxic sites, chemical plants, polluted rivers, the Bronx, refineries, yeah, refineries yeah. the Bronx, the highest rate of adult asthma. So and just talking from my own experience coming from the first super fun site, near Love Canal that, and that's because we were poor and that poor people are contaminated at a greater rate, have less health insurance, have less access to good nutrition, have less education because they want to keep us stupid and therefore don't really care the white kleptocracy, cockocracy, if we're fucking dying at a greater rate. No, I mean, the greatest resource that governments and corporations can use right now are humans. You know, we we are that resource. And yeah, that's the deal that the connection is climate is going to impact marginalized populations, people of color, indigenous communities, people with disabilities. It's so all intertwined. Poor nations, entire nations that are poor. I want to go back to uh, the find your lane. It seems like there's currently a trend with uh, the obsession of purity. So, of course, don't step on other people's toes if you have talent in a field and other people are dedicating their lives to another field. But it seems like sometimes people want these pure designs and if they don't gel with their pure designs, they're willing to reject someone else who can come to the table with something that could actually contribute quite a bit. What I'm getting at is I'm seeing headbutting amongst so-called allies more than ever. And uh, I don't know if that's immaturity, lack of experience, Or just some people just get so dogmatic. So, I I mean, I'm going to go with the first part of what was said, where, you know, there's a, the rise of what's happening out there. For me, it's incredibly inspiring. Of course, there are people that are more experienced activists. And so now you have this element of like people just kind of running out, getting out there on the street, which, which is great. But again, is it organized? Not necessarily. And you see these divided lanes. The most urgent matter is the fact that we are in a full-blown climate crisis Crisis. and a full-blown ecological emergency, which is driving an ecocide. That, to me, is the umbrella over everything. Now, that's a hard conversation to have, though, because that is an existential crisis, call it, where uh, respectfully, those of color, their existential crisis has been not getting shot on the street, you know, every time that they go out. So you have these major, major, call them existential crises happening. And somehow in that, you have to find this unifying language. And as, you know, as as a white woman, I respect that that crisis for people of color they can't step forward maybe in the same way that people of privilege or people of a certain race can but that doesn't mean that we can't all continue to work real fucking hard to understand the greater game here and that greater game is to continue to have the rich get richer at all costs yeah. it's, it's unbelievable I, I can't believe how much we stigmatize all kind of disabilities, like a uh, drug addiction or whatever you got, but we, we refuse to stigmatize 
the filthy rich's mental they're illness. Pathological greed. It, it's, well, it's like they're mentally ill. I actually heard today, and I was kind of shocked, someone on MSNBC saying that, he was talking about the amount of violence, especially in Chicago in the last few weeks. I mean, just so many people are being murdered within certain neighborhoods. And, and this was somebody that came out of a really intense ghetto and rose up. It's not fucking easy. And he, he finally said, you know what? These people have been traumatized. And sometimes when you're traumatized, you don't have any sense of reality or feelings anymore. It's like, you, and he didn't say this, I'm going to fair phrase, really so much of your emotional wherewithal, of your intellectual insight has been already stripped away. You know, we've got some of the highest suicide rates going right now. Well, United, United States, States, you're saying? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of surveys out there that are supporting that we're just not, you know, a happy culture. And the irony of that is that we are the richest country in the world and we have more toys. So to Lydia's point, okay, so all of this buying, which is killing the planet, it's not really helping us psychologically anyway. So to like really go back to where it all starts, humans have lost their connection to Mother Earth. Like we have lost the idea that we are part of this one nature. We're not above it. We've put ourselves in the center too much. We don't put value on every single species. It was certainly here before. All of it it was here before us and we're killing it. So do you think ultimately just by human nature, I'm referring to our flaws, can humans exist on this planet and not be super destructive? I mean, it just seems like, and I, I, I don't want to be dismissive or even too nihilistic or cynical. I'm just like, I just look at the nature of human beings and this behavior, and it's like, <laughs> we can't stop ourselves from killing each other, killing everything, and uh, using every resource until it's used. And going back to what you are saying, we're close to the primate, uh, to chimpanzees, and chimpanzees, if you observe them for a while, it's like, just, they'll just use every resource, destroy it, move on, kill each other too. I well, mean, let's go back in time. You know, before the Bronze Age, we're going back here a ways, when women actually did control a lot of the world, from bronze was made a lot of jewelry, when men, and I, trust me, I, I love my gun as much as the next asshole, when men started making weapons, it's when really women lost a lot of control. What I'm very happy to see right now is there are a lot more women, especially women of color, in positions of power. The problem is also these kleptopathological, moron, sociopath, bullshit artists are making it, and we've just seen it in Georgia, and we just saw it in Kentucky. The same idiots that vote by mail-in ballot call it corrupt and fraudulent. Well, you know what? Everything fucking Donald Trump says, he's guilty of. The guilty are always suspicious. So if he says the next election is going to be the most corrupt because we're going to have mail-in voting, (laughs) uh, that's because he's the fucking most corrupt. We saw people waiting in line in Georgia for six hours and then banging on the door, we want to vote. Kentucky used to have 3,000 polling places down to uh, 20 or one. This is just all part of the problem. It's like, So many people are so activated right now. They're sick of prejudice. They're sick of poverty. They're sick of pollution. They're sick of this mass. I mean, and America was founded on fucking violence. We've been in war every fucking year of our existence since ever 10. I don't even know what 10 they are, but trust me, I'll go back and tell you. A lot of war has happened on our land. We kill our own people. We are mass murdering the planet. And is there a solution other than a complete insurrection and overthrow? I don't think so. I don't think so either. If you, yeah, and don't forget mass incarceration. Oh, God, that's um, a brutal one. So I was lucky to uh, have a conversation the other day with a writer named Ian Haney Lopez. And I would definitely say check out his work. The mass incarceration thing is almost sort of like lets us know the weapon that is being used by the wealthy to create a class system. So everything that we're sort of talking about and the fact that Lydia, like you said, like short of this full blown revolution, all parties in, I don't really know how we reclaim the power of the people, change the government 
so that we can really start making some headway in things like climate and ecological emergencies. I stay in the fight more or less because if you're going to go down, you got to look yourself in the mirror and say like, what side was I on? But it looks very grim. Oh, yes. Tell me uh, a little about your most recent protest, please. And how did that go? It went well. There was a convergence of, you know, two very important things. You have the encampment at City Hall, which have been down there quite a bit in the last few days, but they're obviously there to defund the police. And it was originally kind of put together by Vocal NY and then um, Movement for Black Lives kind of weighed in. And now it's really just very um, autonomous. New York City passed a declaration of climate emergency a year ago, this past Friday. And we were doing an action to draw attention to their serious inaction. Um, So we had, you know, some things planned and we're basically just very, very vocal and had speakers and things. But then we, I was invited by Vocal New York to actually speak because this tie of climate and racial justice, I mean, it just can't be missed. We're not going to succeed on the climate side without racial justice. So the task is to fight both at the same time. So it was, you know, received well, you know, I spoke and the deal is that we wrote in that resolution 864, something called the just transition. And we directly referenced the impact on black, brown, indigenous lives. So people need to know about it because they can use it as something to leverage in their fight. You know, why pass a fucking resolution if you're not going to do anything with it? What do you think right now are, I mean, there are so many urgent climate concerns, species concern, planetary concerns. I mean, there are so many pressing issues on the echo side that is happening. Just tell me, you know, just give me a few facts or figures of what people really need to be aware of. I mean, I just saw the other day about how the South Pole is melting three times faster. We know about the Siberian fires, 100 degrees. What are the most pressing things right now? Yeah, so every day seems to bring something more pressing and following, you know, I recognize that it's a task for the average person to sort of stay on point and know when the wool is, you know, getting pulled over your eyes and there's intended diversions of sorts. But just for to keep matters extremely current, today Trump appointed uh, an extremist, anti-environmentalist to be the, you know, head of public lands. So these types of things are happening all the time with his administration. In terms of environmental ecology, you know, the impact of what we're seeing, you kind of hit it yourself. So the biggest umbrella that I can draw for everyone would be, again, to, to point out the loss of species at such a rapid pace that it's you cannot compare it to previous extinctions, which is sort of often the comeback from people who are not willing to accept what's happening, you know, and don't have the courage and are living in a state of denial So it's incomparable, the loss of species that we're seeing with that number being 60% in just the last 50 years alone. And just today, there was another article out in the New York Times that the rate of insects and turtles and things like that, that it's speeding up a lot faster. So you have this really, really, really dramatic loss of life that is accelerating at a speed that we've not seen. And then the other very key thing I would say are what are called the, the feedback loops. So someone can go online and they could just Google, you know, what is a feedback loop? And unfortunately, you're going to find that they're the metric for, you know, are we going to survive or not? And it's looking less and less likely, but eight of them are fully going right now. The runaway train is, is on the way, you know, and, t- and today to keep more current news and then I'll stop gabbing. You had the Democrats that came out, uh, which, you know, they more or less said that this is kind of part of the the new Green Deal. And what they're actually proposing and what they're putting forward is absolutely unacceptable. And in my opinion, it is the road to hell because basically they're they're saying that they can, they're aiming for 88% carbon reduction within 50 
Like 2050. 50, yeah. 2050. Okay, sorry. 30 years. That is way, 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 way too far out of, you know, of a goal. And at that, we're just not. And if you watch it, if you look at Trump, they can go back and block it. Even if they make any progress, it's not like. Urgent it's just not all, like right. the, the collective urgency really just isn't there. And I almost feel like if you're not going to act with this level of urgency, then really start talking to everybody about emergency preparedness. Like then just shift the whole conversation and start telling people fucking get ready, learn how to grow your own food, do whatever you got to do. Cause it is going to be a shit show, you know, in 15. There's a lot of uh, people, analysts and, and just critics and stuff that think if there's going to be a, a thermonuclear disaster, it's going to happen between India and Pakistan because they rely on the Himalayas, which are just melting at rates that are, they can't even believe. And then suddenly you got 1.5 billion people with no water, which you need to live. And oh boy, that's going to be And the irony of the Himalayas, you know, what's happening around there, it's like you reference the, the melting of water. But think about the fact that you have populations of people that don't have the infrastructure to potentially capture that water. So it's almost like this evil twist where, yeah, they're melting, but they're also experiencing a lack, you know, of a way to have fresh water. It's just, I mean, everything is really turned on its head right now. Flooding, droughts, and locusts all at the Uh, same time. Yeah, pandemics. Today, more current news just for today. Another pandemic is moving out of China um, from, uh, yeah, another kind of... Animal a new agricultural fuck up. Part of our, our species are so ignorant about just the idea of a symbiotic relationship with everything that's living and exists on this earth. In fact, they think they discovered a new organ even within our own body that is the symbiotic organ amongst all the other organs. And we didn't know about it forever if it's true. So like we don't even know like people don't, they just think they exist and it doesn't have any relationship to anything. How do we communicate with people how important that is for their dumb existence? It's important that we don't destroy everything. Like how do you well, communicate? Well, you know, I would tell anybody to kind of dive into somebody like Ian Lopez's work. It's something called a survival solidarity. It, like you have to find the reason that people want to be motivated to step into action. And when they're not really feeling the impact, the blunt punch right between the eyes, which is what I really think has to happen for all humans, um, then it's very, 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 very challenging because it's rolling out. Like there are obviously people all over the world that are experiencing climate crisis. And so they're not disputing it in the same way that 40% of Americans are we're still kind of just getting by and our tolerance, I think our threshold for trauma and violence and all these things is going up exponentially, which is, you know, really kind of the tragedy. I just listened to mercy me, you know, before I got on Marvin Gaye, like like one of my all time favorites. Mercy, mercy. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. about wow. radiation, you know, and, and it's in 1971. You're talking 50 years ago. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I love Bala confusion by the temptations. There you Dealing with similar subjects. The thing is, too, I think that people in this country, first of all, so uneducated, a lot of them, purposefully so, so selfish and so frightened of losing whatever it is they have. If they really understood what was at stake, everybody would be in the streets protesting every single day. Yeah, it's willful ignorance, you know, without a doubt. And I have a very good friend who worked on a, she created a film, Women of the White Buffalo, which is about murdered and missing indigenous women. And she just came out with a kind of a shorter trailer to draw attention to this film. And a, a in the, the Lakota, yeah, the which Lakota I was at women last or? summer and met these extraordinary warrior strength women because really the females are the ones that are trying to repair the brokenness, you know, of their societies. You got meth addictions and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, so they she just created this much shorter little video to bring attention. And it's based on a poem that Sunrose Ironshell, um, who is a powerhouse of a woman that I met, a young Lakota woman, she wrote a poem 
And she's basically just giving it to the white man, these Euro descendants. But in it, there's a really key line, you know, where she says, you claim that you own these lands, but yet, you know, it's my blood and, and sweat and tears that are protecting the sacred. And more or less, you act as though there will never, ever be a seventh generation again. And this is a big, big problem with deep rooted from these ancestors of ours, these white European ancestors that came over. They came over to America to do nothing but rape, pillage and steal from this country and kill. And And I would task any person who calls themselves an American to ask them, if you're an American, why don't you give a fuck about your homeland, which is to preserve it, to protect its beauty, its water, its air. And I think, which a Native American had shared this, I had a conversation about this. It's like we've never adopted that this is home and there's one, you know, and we share it and we've been destroying it from the beginning of our arrival. Well, who treats their home? Like that. We've spoken about I've spoken about that many times. And as a matter of fact, on our July 4th special, which was the previous week, I was talking about how the Lakota, the South Dakota, Mount Rushmore, three slave owners carved there by a Ku Klux Klan wizard. That land was supposed to be Lakota land in perpetuity. We know what was done to the indigenous people of this country and then just about everybody else. But until Amer- until Americans realize and don't be so fucking proud, because really what we were based on and we know this was murder, execution and domination, the freedom to be as absolutely fucking pig like and gluttonous as possible. And here we are today. And really what has changed? So, again, Go back and listen I mean, to the Fourth of July like, special. The, you know, because the question was asked, like, how do we get out of this one? And I, I really believe that unless you are willing to sort of listen to that ancient wisdom from women like the Lakota, I don't really know another way at this point. I mean, I'm standing up in action, disruptive action. Absolutely, we should all be doing that. But there's a much deeper level to it, which is, again, to reteach people how to connect with Mother Earth. And they know how to do that. You know, it's like, and at one point we did too. I'm not quite sure where the distortion came in. I mean, I will broadly say white supremacy and what we've done, we are holding all the guilt. But I am losing faith in humans entirely that I sort of wonder you know, is it always just going to be like whoever's on top and whoever has power is going to take whatever they can? That that is our species, though. That is our species. I mean, we are a flawed species. And just like anything, when it becomes too dominant, I mean, if you look at Madagascar, you look at island culture, that's always studied in biology. There's always one thing that dominates and then it can't hold its own weight. It collapses on itself. And that's why islands are always studied with, with these things. And are we going to collapse ourselves? Other thing is always the average length of a, a species is like four million years. So we're we're like pretty close right now. I mean. But but again, with all of the protests that are happening, both with Black Lives Matter, with Extinction Rebellion, Black Trans Lives Matter, and with so many people coming together in the streets, yet daily there are crimes being committed against this planet by the men in positions of power who have forever been pillaging, plundering, and raping this female planet. And half the time, we don't even know what these crimes are until they're much, until we, they reveal much later. And the issue is when millionaires are in seats of power, first of all, where is that money coming from and where are they putting it? So if you really are proud people, that a fake billionaire who's bankrupted, claimed bankruptcy six times, and we know he's fading every day. The damage is already being done. How are we going to undo that? So my question to you is, what can we do? Tell us what we should do. I know what you do. You're out there protesting and you're spreading the word like uh, the way that I feel myself. You're like uh, the woman on the hill with the bullhorn and you're not going to stop. I yeah, know babe. if it was me... Well, I did do this personally, but if I would encourage everybody to carve out a space in their day 
week, however long it takes you, but to do your own due diligence investigation. Look at the science, evaluate it however you want, but create the space so that you can, in a sense, begin a mourning process. To be educated. To be educated, educated. but also to like give the space where you're like, wow, okay, this is pretty bad. And to ask yourself, you know, a deep fucking question, which again is like, how do you want to look back that you sat by? Or, you know, when you look at your children, when you look at your grandchildren, who do you want to be? Like, are you perfectly fine with just being a passerby? And, you know, and so I think people have to do that investigative work. What are some of the best like news sources you can recommend for people or, you know, writers even like you recommended before Lopez? I mean, I would tell anybody, obviously, I'm with Extinction Rebellion and there are tremendous reading materials on our websites. You know, we have resources and you can drill right into the resources. You're going to find some of the best writers who are talking about the science. You're going to find great activists. Both, both the U.S. and the U.K. sites. U.S. Yeah, and U.K. sites. so you sites. can really dig into both of those and you're going to get an unbelievable amount of vetted, I would say vetted, you know, information. I would definitely start there. One thing, um, just it's partially my own curiosity and just interest in other humans. I often infiltrate or just hang out in um, bars or places with people with radically different views, political views, perceptions than I have, often like working class places. So what I'm getting at is how do we communicate with people about something that's urgent? Because within all the, even the people on the right side of these things, there are definitely some people that are more into the uh, the fight rather than the solution. And I'm, I'm always more interested in the solution and you kind of get, have to get people in. You can't alienate. Yeah. Them. So the, I, the majority, you know, 60% of people, I, I don't know the exact number, honestly, but you know, I figure it's more than half of Americans believe in climate crisis. Like they've accepted that it's real. Right. The challenge is time and how fast we have to move and the urgency of it. So truthfully, the people that are so far over here, you know, so far away from being able to be reached, fuck them uh, because we don't actually. We- I, I actually have one solution for that. I, you know, I've actually communicated with some of those people and I always do this. Let's assume you're a hundred percent right. Now let's talk about that. Let's assume none of this is man may have just, some natural cycle of whatever. And, you know, we do all this hard work and we do all this stuff to change. What the fuck's wrong with having a cleaner, nicer environment? Right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's the worst that could come from this. I mean, yeah, what's wrong I mean, with I, that? You know, I <laughs> say fuck them, but I, the reason I want to back up why I really said no, it is because if you follow, you know, nonviolent civil disobedience, the, the model has always been that if you can get three and a half percent of a population to consistently rise up to cause disruption that you can actually change the course of things, change a lot of, you can move the political will dials. So three and a half percent appears, you know, to be a low number until you really break it out. You're like, Oh my God, we got to get this many people. So that's why I say F them to the ones that are so far over because the ones that are on the fence (laughs) are the ones that we need to motivate into more action. And that's a big chunk. Also, I have to wonder if, you know, with the increase and and there's no denying it of floods, of tornadoes, of locusts, of hurricanes, of cyclones. And so many people, especially even in America, who have been wiped out by these much grander sized disasters in places that have never faced them before. They have to realize this is not just the normal track of things that everything is in danger and nature is rebelling because we have disrespected for so long. And I don't think anybody that's been the victim of a hurricane or a flood in this country is going to deny that something is very, very wrong. And that's horrible, especially when they're homeless. They might end up all in the streets protesting because as is with this pandemic, when jobs are being lost, when pandemics are swelling, when it is not safe, when there is no money, there is going to be 
And you can call it a protest and you can say peaceful civil disobedience if you want. But I do think there is going to be violent, whether it's from Mother Nature or from the people that have been devastated by it. Things have got to change before something really radical or maybe things are not going to change until something really radical. And the way that I see it, it's already radical. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you say like, who doesn't think the hurricanes and all these kind of things, that there's something wrong with that. I actually would argue that a lot of people have come up with ways to sort of justify it as, you know, it's normal course of nature, but kind of to your second point. So I go around, I speak publicly, you know, we give our heading for extinction talk and I always hit on some really key things because I've, there's so much information to try and convey. I always think, well, what's really going to like resonate with people. And the two things that, I will always try and stress is that we're going to see food shortages at a level that people in this country can't even imagine. Like that will be what will come in natural course because of the disturbing weather patterns, loss of farms, et cetera. The other thing, just like you said, is that you are going to see extreme violence. So everything that we've been trying to do, call it like proactive to mitigate these levels of violence that we know are coming and no, it won't be this organized disruption. It will be chaos and societal collapse. Um, and so the pandemic's just the, the yeah, opening act. It's, it's, it's just the right, opening right, act. We yeah. just detailed when we got on the call, we already have another one breaking loose. We got an extremist who's going to be selling off public. Like, yeah, it's the first of, of I think many, and I think they'll come faster is the thing. It's like, like I said, it's like, basically buckle up you know it's it's just going to go faster and faster this has been the lydian spin with lydia lunch tim doll and uh, kareth creole of extinction rebellion and i really advise people to investigate both the u.s and the uk sites do whatever they can to educate themselves about not only the disaster we're in right now because we are in an ecological disaster they are committing ecocide the planet is under a violent domination by the fossil fuel industry there are microplastics at the bottom of the ocean oh boy. further than they've ever traveled they're finding cans a fucking Coca-Cola. There is microplasm in almost plastic in almost every fish you eat. And the ocean is going and next will be, and we've already had, you know, farmlands wiped out in this country before food is going to be an issue. Water is going to be an issue. The air we already know is fucked. And eight years that's how long we've got to turn it around. And I'm just going to quote so again. So we're up to this about, right now. If anybody's uh, yeah. on IG. Duck on my mind. Can, uh, okay. We're taking on the tech industry and basically calm. Big tech loves yeah. big oil. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, you know, the fucking oil, the oil was, I, I can't believe I ever witnessed in my life oil. They're paying you to take oil at the, during the last few months. Amazing. And of course, Texas with the current surge, it's like, I mean, they made the poor go back to work because, I mean, they got screwed. And guess what? They're going to get screwed right. harder. Kareth, what, this word is personal to me. When I was a child, my parents bought me this globe. <laughs> they bought me this globe, and I would just look at the whole thing and study it. And I looked at Antarctica, and there's this huge chunk that was on the globe that wasn't part of land. It was called the Ross Ice Shelf. And it was the thing was like the size of countries basically and 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 then of course the last 20 years because i was always made references to it like just as a joke with drinks like well what about the ross ice shelf i it was just some obscure thing and i just hear these things like huge chunks are falling off all the time i'm like this thing that i loved as a kid's gonna be gone forever i think you know what tim a lot of things you loved as a Ah! kid are gonna be gone yeah i guess like the right to breathe The right to breathe, the right to eat food that is not poisoned, the right to plant on a land that is not polluted, the right to fucking exist. These might all be gone. See, that's why, you know what? Night rolls around, honey, and you know how I am. I say, get your pleasure where you can because nighttime rolls around. I own the dark before the dark encompasses all of us. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. I'd love to leave everybody on one last thought here, which is like, think about, and then everyone can go away and think about this. You know, I don't know what anyone's belief on like soul reincarnation or whatever that may be. I'm sort of 
undecided myself. But what I have thought about is that I find it curious to me that I am here and I've been here for this time of witness. You know, we've, we've known for 50 years, we've been watching this beast roll out slowly. And so, you know, there can be an incredible movement of power, like your own personal power to think about the idea that like you are here at this time to witness potentially, you know, the extinction of life on earth. And do you want it to be that way? Or do you want to jump in? Like it is that pivotal time. We could have dropped on earth 700 years ago, but none of us did. We're here now. Oh yeah, we did. (laughs) Actually, sister, we did drop on earth many centuries ago (laughs) because why we have the power of the female protest and the warrior in us is because I don't, it's not reincarnation to me. It's the molecular memory of the powerful women that were in our past. And let's trace it before the bronze age, women ran the world. When men learned how to make weapons out of bronze instead of jewelry, that's when we lost the planet fear of a fucking female planet. They better get used to it because we are the only salvation. Thank Thank you very much. Extinction rebellion, Lydia lunch, Tim doll. (laughs) 